Well, as you find your seat, I hope you have a copy of God's Word. If you don't, there's some Bibles in the back that you're always welcome to. You can pull up the app we, we mentioned or any other smart device. We're going to be in the Old Testament predominantly this morning, and we're going to look at a story of friends. We're in this series called Ripple Effect, and it's really uh, part two of the series we started last month. And we're going to be talking about relationships all this month. It's going to be a great series. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the necessity in our lives for healthy friendships. And, and there's no really better place to start, I don't think, in the scriptures, in the, than the life and the story of David and Jonathan. It's a complicated story, which is good, because I, when we think about our friendships, we think about our relationships, we'll talk about family relationships next week, but complicated is a fair word when it, when it comes to the way many of our relationships or friendships are. And so this is a great story, because like most of us in our relationships, it's got some layers uh, and it's got some history. You know, when I was thinking about this message, and there's, there's times when, and you know this if you've come to preaching, and I, I listen to preaching during the week. I don't listen to my own. Um, I've had enough of it after two services and doing a message each week. But, but I do listen to preaching. I've got friends that are pastors. And so I do a lot of podcasts and, and uh, other, other guys that I, that I like to listen to uh, because it's good to sit under preaching. And so there's times when I'll listen to a preaching podcast from a friend or something, and i I'll, I'll know that there's application from my life, but it doesn't necessarily feel like it's applying directly to me. Maybe it's an area of my life where I'm, I feel stronger or an area of my life where I'm growing in spiritual maturity. So I know there's biblical and practical application, uh, but maybe not necessarily hits me in the way others do. There are also times when I'll listen to a, a, a sermon and feel like, man, this is hitting me exactly where I am in my life. Like it's, it's almost the exact things I'm going through, the, th the same passages and promises that I was looking for and needing in my life. And I listen to a message and it's just, it feels like it has direct impact on my life specifically. And, and I imagine there's times where you feel that way, where you're on one side or the other. I will tell you this, in this series uh, about relationships, this is gonna be one of those that we feel like most of the time it's going to hit us right where we are because I think this is a great area of struggle for many of us. And I'll tell you this as we kind of open this, this conversation is one of the most underestimated areas of importance in our lives, especially on a spiritual journey, is friendship. I think it is one of the most underestimated areas of importance in our lives and we forget how important and necessary it is for spiritual growth and spiritual maturity that we have other people in our lives that are prompting us and helping us to be more like Jesus. And this doesn't have anything to do with, with your personality or where you land on any kind of personality test. Every single one of us, especially those that are followers of Jesus, pursuing the things of God, we desperately need healthy friendships in our lives if we want to be at our best spiritually. And Scripture talks about this from beginning to end. Here's a couple of examples from the Old Testament. These are ones that you might have heard of. Proverbs 27 Verse 9, when talking about friendship, says this, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, A friend loves at all times that a brother is born for adversity. And there's likely been times in your life where a friend has stood there with you in a time of adversity. Again, in Proverbs 27, it says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man, or one person in this case, one person, one man sharpens another. And one of the things I think that's interesting, if you look at media and culture, um, some of the most, uh, most watched or most popular um, uh, sitcoms, movies, dramas of all time have been focused on uh, a, the relationship of a group of friends. Some of the most popular series that we've ever seen have been a series that were about friendship. And it's, it's something that culture and media itself has become fascinated with. Lately, what I see is reality shows, um, they've become fascinated with this issue of isolation. And there's a show called Alone, where the concept is basically, let's get 30 or 40 people, drop them out off in the wilderness and film them and see who stays the longest. The one that stays the longest gets the most money. And it's basically watching people crumble emotionally under the struggle of isolation. And if we know anything about the way God created us, and really this message could have started back in Genesis, but for the sake of time, I'll just say this. We were not created to be alone. We were created for each other. We are going to be at our best spiritually when we have people in our lives that live life with us and that help us. And when we think about our friendships and the ripple effect that they have in our lives, there, there's a subtle tension that we have to acknowledge, especially to have a good conversation. And it's this, is that we undervalue the importance of healthy relationships in our lives. We undervalue how desperately we need good, godly, spiritually mature friends in our lives. 
we need it more than we think we do. And we forget to recognize how important that is and how much we need that and how much and how necessary they are for maximum spiritual growth. And I'll mention this, and I'm not giving an opinion on this. I'm just gonna say this because I think it's important. In an age of online dating and relationship matching websites and social media and digital friendships, our relationship muscles have atrophied. Okay, we, we, we've become very good at digital engagement, but at the same time, we've become not as good and we've atrophied some of our relationship muscles when it comes to deep, transparent, and intimate face-to-face -face relationships with one another that we desperately need in order to grow for maximum spiritual growth. So we're gonna dive into this. We're gonna look at the relationship of David and Jonathan. Before we do that, I wanna just give you this little paragraph here. I wanna remind us of the gospel because really, I'm, I could give you one statement on this and that could be the end of the message, but I'm not, I'm not gonna do that obviously because I'm gonna use my time, right? But what most of us need is we need to overlay the gospel on our friendships. That's what we really need. We need the elements of the gospel to, to be overlaid on our friendships because it changes everything. And we think about when you and I became followers of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian or you'd say that, you'd say, McLean, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. There was a time in your life then that you understood grace and you understood forgiveness and you understood hope and you understood faith and you understood all these things that were necessary to be in a relationship with God for our salvation. What we forget is that Many times after that point or process of salvation, we live our lives absent of the gospel elements, meaning we move on with our lives. We forget that we, the same elements of the gospel that we needed for our salvation are the same elements of the gospel that we need every single day in our lives. And so we, we start living our lives absent of the elements of the gospel and it begins to show up in our friendships. So what we really need for healthy friendships is to overlay the gospel onto our friendships because the gospel is, it's a lifestyle we choose. It's not a one-time, one-moment decision we make. It's, it's a choice that I'm gonna choose to live the way of Jesus. I'm gonna choose to live my life every day like Jesus did. I wanna live as Jesus lived. And so when we think about friendships, we, we can't leave the gospel out because that's what we need more than anything. More than anything I need in my life to be a godly friend is to remember the elements of the gospel and exchange those in my friendships. But... That's really the heart of the message. We're gonna take a long detour, about 20 more minutes, all right? So you think about love, you think about grace, you think about peace and forgiveness. Those are the things. And this is the ripple effect. You see, what I'm experiencing because of my friendships is because of the choices I've made in those friendships. It's because of the things that I've thrown into those friendships. You know, we, we talk about this ripple effect and this is kind of how this series title came to be. When we, we think about like our life and our friendships, especially in this case, and we'll talk about family relationships, you know, what we're, the ripple effects we're experiencing are from the rocks that we've thrown into those things. And we've all done this on a still pond or, you know, we've thrown a rock and you've seen the ripple effects. Well, in our lives, we have these two buckets and I've got buckets of rocks on this side and buckets of rocks on this side. And these are the things that I'm chunking into my relationships. So over here, I have things like the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, forgiveness, all these things. So if I'm tossing these into my friendships, right? if I'm tossing gentleness and kindness, then the ripple effect of that, I'm gonna feel in my life. I'm gonna experience it. And it's gonna be healthy and good. But at the same time, we know over here, we have the opposite of all those things. We have judgment and we have jealousy and we have unkindness and we have bitterness and we hold honking big grudges all the time. And so when we're tossing those rocks into our friendships, we're gonna feel the ripple effect of those too, which, which means it's very important that we know how to have healthy friendships for maximum spiritual growth because every single one of us needs gospel-centered people in our life that move us to be more like Jesus. And a great place to start is the story of David and Jonathan. We're gonna start 1 Samuel 18. Full disclosure, you're gonna to have to read some of this on your own because the story of David and Jonathan and their relationship, it's complicated. There's a bunch going on. We're not gonna be able to get to all of it today. It goes through the rest of 1 Samuel. So you can, uh, it really begins in, in chapter 16 through the end of that, that book. And then David Drain as king picks up in 2 Samuel. So some of this I want you to read on your own, but I'll just read this kind of as an opener. 1 Samuel Chapter 18, verse one says this. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and he gave it to David. 
and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So some of you probably know this story. David and Jonathan were deep, deeply close friends and we, we, we read this very intimate language that their soul was knitted together. They had a deep love of friendship. Uh, r- frankly, like many of us maybe n- never experienced, but like our friendships, their friendship was complicated. So Saul was the king. He was evil. He was disobedient to the Lord. And so God brought some punishment on his life. And the punishment was that his lineage or the reign of Saul's family would end and a new lineage would start, which is the lineage of David. And we know that also fulfills tons of prophecy about the line of David, right? So Saul's lineage is going to end and David's is going to begin. So in, in 1 Samuel 16, David is anointed as king. And you remember the story, the prophet Samuel goes and they, and they call everybody up, call all Jesse's sons and, and they forget about David. Yeah, I've got one left, but there's no way it could be him and it's him, it's David, so they anoint him. And in that passage, it says that when, Saul, when Samuel the prophet anointed David, that the spirit of the Lord came on David. And if you also read in, in 1 Samuel 16, it says at the same time that the spirit of the Lord left Saul and what, was, what came on to Saul was the spirit of torment. So in 16, we see this spiritual transition begin to take place. But what has to happen is just a truckload of chaos between David and Saul before this, actually, this actual transition takes place. So we know at his anointing, the spirit of the Lord came on David and he began to transition to be the king that, that God was raising up. But what makes this complicated is Saul's lineage was stopping, which, which means his son, Jonathan, who should take the throne, was not going to. And Jonathan was a good man, according to Scripture. And so it's an unlikely friendship that David is becoming best friends and, and deeply connected to the one whose role of king that he's actually taking. And to make it more complicated, David marries Jonathan's sister. You know, I don't know if anybody has a testimony of marrying your best friend's sister that wants to stand up and share that story, but I imagine it's complicated, all right? So you have Saul who at this point begins this spirit of torment over his life. So he starts trying to find ways to kill David. So David thinks, well, here's a good idea. Since this guy's trying to kill me, I'm gonna befriend his son and marry his daughter. Okay, so this is all going on. So when we think our friendships are complicated, David's friendships were very complicated. They had layers, just like Ours do. And so what's interesting about this is while you could easily see why David was like, "Mm, I don't know about that. I'm not sure I want to get involved with a family that every time I go there, somebody throws a spear at my head. And I certainly don't want to marry someone whose father-in-law keeps telling people to find me and kill me. But he did. And so he gets in this deep relationship with Jonathan. Listen again to what the scripture says. It says the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Meaning this was not a superficial friendship. This was a deep friendship. This was a friendship anointed by God. And it says, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And I mentioned it before, but I think this is a depth of friendship that many Christ followers rarely experience. I think because we have complications and layers and past and hurts like David did and Jonathan did, I think at times it's tempting to keep many of our friendships at a superficial level. And we never get to this level of friendship where we know that our soul is united with another but I think that's the place where we really can experience the goodness of God in our relationships. And I think what David and Jonathan experienced in their relationship was because they knew that this friendship would help both of them. Jonathan was going to face some hardships because of who his dad was and the punishment that his family was receiving. And we know that David's life becomes very, very complicated through scriptures. But we have to remember this, that God's given us friendships for a couple of reasons. One is to show us his love and grace and to give us accountability and spiritual growth in our lives. And that type of friendship is not one that can be experienced digitally. And I think so many times we settle for superficial friendships rather than deep, intimate friendships that shape us into the likeness of Christ. So here's the question. How can we have this depth of relationship that David and Jonathan have? How can we have someone in our life that we would say that that we are so deeply connected to them spiritually and emotionally that our souls are knit together, that it's a deep intimate, abiding friendship. Here's a couple of things. First is this, humility. Humility sets us free to grow in healthy friendships. Humility sets us free to grow in healthy friendships. Jonathan was in a difficult position because he was often forced to choose between uh, a mandate that came down from his father who happened to be the king 
and helping his, his best friend uh, ex- escape death, literally. And so Jonathan knew that the sins of his father had cost him the opportunity for greater leadership, yet he humbled himself in the presence of David, who he knew was the soon-to-be king, the one that God had anointed. And he loved his friend, and he allowed this love to be expressed through these humble acts and this lifestyle of humility. And that humility is what allowed their relationship to grow. And we, we see it all through Jonathan's choices. We see it in the life of David, too. Because if you read about David's life, he was next in line for the king, and everything he attempted was successful. And, and we see this when, when, the, uh, when his relationship with Saul kind of reaches its apex. It's because these, these things keep happening where uh, one of the songs the people used to sing during this uh, time of transition was, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of, tens of thousands. And the people begin to recognize that, man, the hand of God was on David and that this spirit of torment was, was taking Saul and changing his life. And so David is growing in popularity and people begin to see that he's the next one. Yet during all this time, he kept himself with a humble attitude and he kept himself in harm's way. He stayed close to Jonathan. And so the greater story of, of David and Jonathan shows us that David and Jonathan both choose humility. And I think that humility in their life and the humility in their choices with one another sets them free to grow in healthy relationships. Because if you, if you really unpack, and we didn't do all of it, but if you really unpack how complicated this friendship is, nobody would have blamed David for walking away. Nobody would have blamed David for kind of going and doing his own thing and waiting until Saul's time was over. Nobody would have blamed him. But David stayed close to this family because out of humility, he wanted to be close to his friend And humility sets us free to grow in healthy relationships. One of the things that will help us in our friendships is to make sure that we're constantly throwing these rocks of humility, that we're choosing humility over pride in our friendship when things happen because we begin to feel the ripple effects of those. Here's the next one, loyalty. Loyalty is an expression of love that shows honor and healthy friendships. And full disclosure on this one, there's four of these. This is the one that I struggle with the most, right? Uh, and as a pastor, part of pastoring is, is weathering breakups every week. This is what it kind of feels like, uh, where somebody will come to our church and I'll meet them and they're a great family or a great person. I'll get to know them and then they'll vanish. They just ghost us, you know, and God leads them somewhere else or they go somewhere else or we're not their style or we're not their taste. And so loyalty is so difficult for me in friendships because when you pastor a church and you pastor people and those people become your friends and those people, some of those people end up leaving, it's like, you know, it's, it's like get, having a breakup every single week, you know? So it causes you to be, be on guard. It causes you to kind of have your defenses up. But because of that, what I appreciate the most in my life when it comes to friendship is loyalty. It's the thing I struggle with the most because of past hurts, but it's the thing that I appreciate more than anything in my life is loyalty and faithfulness and friendship. And so one of the patterns throughout the relationship of David and Jonathan is, is Saul's constantly trying to kill David. When you start in 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, through the end of it, until Saul and Jonathan finally die, it's just this constant pursuit of Saul trying to find ways to kill David. And part of it is Jonathan keeps helping David. The other part of it is David is just a much better warrior than Saul. And in chapter 19, Saul is again trying to find ways to kill David. And so here's what it says in verse one. And we think about loyalty in this verse. It says, and Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And so through all these uh, passages, we read this, that Saul's trying to find a way and Jonathan lets David know and he keeps protecting him. And they have all these scenarios and schemes to hide. We'll see one of those in in a little while. But Jonathan knew that he could express his love for David by being loyal to him. And David the same way. They they were loyal to each other. They were not just committed to each other. They were also committed to the friendship. They were committed to the friendship, but they were also committed to each other. And there's a big difference. I didn't tell the story in the first service. I'll tell it in this one. But I remember reading an article. I may have shared this with you before. I remember, you know, and and granted, I'll be 45 in a couple of weeks. So I'm I'm an 80s, 90s kid. I remember reading the story after Chris Farley died. Um, And I I remember reading about his funeral. He died at his apartment of a drug overdose in Chicago. I don't remember what year. It's been a long time. But I remember reading this article, and they were interviewing all these old Saturday Night Live guys that he was was doing all these sketches with in in those days, right? And every one of those people talked about what a great guy he was, how funny he was, but a lot of them didn't go to his funeral just because 
they felt bad, they didn't want to go of the hurt. And this interviewer asked every one of his friends in this article, did you know that Chris had an addiction? And they all said, yes. And then his follow-up question was, did you ever talk to him about it or confront him about it? And every one of them said, no. And one person said, what we realized with Chris was that we were more committed to the friendship than we were the friend. Right, that the loyalty stopped at the friend. The loyalty was just for, because Chris was the good time guy, Chris was this, but, but nobody ever had a conversation with him about this because their loyalty stopped at the friendship. They weren't committed to him as a person. And there were so many times in this story of David and Jonathan where they, their loyalty could have just stopped at the friendship, but it continued to a depth of soul that no matter what happened around them, they were for each other, and it was an expression of their love for each other. Here's the next one. So we're tossing these stones of humility, these stones of loyalty into our friendships. Here's the next one, kindness. Kindness is the currency we exchange in healthy relationships. So in 1 Samuel 20, we read again another account of Saul trying to kill David, and then Dave, and Jonathan bravely warming him. And obviously this is an act of kindness by a friend, and they, and they, uh, they describe their relationship the writer does it in 1 Samuel 20, 17, and he says, And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. You see, healthy relationships at times, and you've heard this, if you heard that relationships with this um, metaphor, that it's kind of a system of deposits and withdrawals, right? So kindness is the currency then that we exchange in this. So if, if this is true and relationships are really just, I'm, I'm making deposits in other people, my friendships, I'm making deposits of kindness into their life because I know that there's, there's eventually gonna come a time I'm gonna say something stupid or do something stupid, which is a relational and emotional withdrawal. And I wanna make sure that I'm not overdrawn in my emotional account with them. I wanna make sure that I've deposited enough kindness into their life so when that moment comes which it will where I'll say or do something stupid that that withdrawal is not bigger than the deposits I've made so I'm not sure how that works I'm not sure if that's actually true but if it is true then kindness is the currency that we exchange in healthy relationships that even relationships that are at a distance or relationships that are far away or relationships that are superficial even or relationships that are deep or relationships that are shallow in all of those we can still exchange kindness and it becomes the currency in our healthy relationships. And we see this in the life of David and Jonathan. I added this part to the message early this morning. I cut it out earlier in the week because of time. And I know the message is going to be long this morning. But I added this back early this morning because I, because I think David's greatest act of kindness to Jonathan happened after Jonathan died. You see, at the end of the book of 1 Samuel Saul and Jonathan die, right? And so there's a time of mourning. And the scripture says that David mourns, tears his clothes, he mourns, he goes through the mourning process. And obviously he's mourning deeper for the loss of his friend Jonathan than he is the loss of his arch nemesis Saul. But he has a time of mourning. So when the time of mourning is over, kind of second Samuel, the book starts. And this is when we begin to read of David kind of becoming anointed officially as king and the transition takes place and he starts his kingship. But in second Samuel chapter nine, it says this. And David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Meaning that because Jonathan was gone, David didn't have anybody we don't think at this point in his life that he loved like Jonathan as a friend. And so he said, I've got this kindness that I've always given away to Jonathan. Is there anybody left in his family that I could show that same kind of kindness? And it's when David discovers that Jonathan has a son named Mephibosheth that was crippled in both legs, as scripture says. So David, as the king, sends for him, brings him, and doesn't treat him as a guest, but treats him as his own son, which is David's greatest act of kindness to Jonathan, I think, happened even after his death, and it's the mark of a good and true friend. So we're tossing rocks of humility, loyalty, and kindness. Here's the last one, faithfulness. Faithfulness is the evidence of a friendship that's surrendered to the Lord. I think at times the healthiest friendships we have are those old friendships, not friendships because we're old, if we're old, but those friendships that have lasted, those friendships that have stood the test of time, those that we've had for a long time. Those are those long-standing friendships where you know that even if it's been a while, that's a person you could call. And if you had a need or you had a struggle, that you knew that they would answer the phone, that they would come through for you, that they would help you if you needed it. Those faithful friends that you may not see all the time, but when you do, it seems like the friendship hasn't even missed anything based on time. And that's the kind of 
friendship that David and Jonathan had, they were faithful. They were faithful. And in 1 Samuel 20, if you go back, they had just succeeded in another plan to uh, spoil Saul's wishes of killing David. And this time, they're, and you've read this story where they use the arrows and they shoot the arrows and it's kind of a signaling system. And if the arrow goes this far and David goes this far, it's Jonathan's way of letting him know that Saul was close or far away. And they enlist the help of this little boy. And so they use this scheme. And again, David's able to escape. And here's what scripture says about that in 1 Samuel 20 and 40 through, uh, 41 through 42. It says, and as soon as the boy had gone, this is talking about the boy that helped him escape. It says, as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and he fell on his face to the ground and he bowed three times. And they kissed one another and they wept with one another, David weeping the most. Listen to this. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. So they, they finally come to the place where they were having to go their separate ways for this season. But they swore to each other that this friendship's not ending because we're having to go our separate ways because it's founded in the Lord. It's between me and you. It's between our families forever. And when you read this, it makes so much sense when you read about what David did for Jonathan's son, even after Jonathan had died, because they were faithful. As I was preparing this message earlier in the week, I was and you'll have the opportunity to do this now, but I was remembering in my mind faithful friends from my past. Um, I was remembering just friendships we had and, and thinking about people that were meaningful to me. And, and as I was doing that, it reminded me of a message I got about two years ago. It actually, it was the end of, at the end of 2019. Um, I got a Facebook message. It was, it was sent to me and another friend, and it was from a guy that I hadn't seen in 20 plus years that we grew up together. Uh, and it was a guy that I really hadn't thought of. And you know how you'll hear about what happens to your old friends. They go different ways. Well, this is a guy that I didn't even, I didn't even know where he went or what happened. And so he sends me a, a message, and it's, it's a group message with another old friend. And his name is Brent. And we were high school friends. But everybody called him Norm, and I can't remember why we called him Norm. But he, just, he was known as Norm. And we spent a lot of time together, had good times and some mischief together, and uh, his parents had a pool, uh, and I grew up in Snellville, Georgia, in the Atlanta suburbs. And in old downtown Snellville, his mom and dad had an old house with a, with a pool. So we spent a lot of time at his house. And so I just started, I saw this message come up, and I was curious. So I wanted to read it to you, because I think it, it's interesting when we talk about faithfulness. So he wrote me this note. Here's what he said, and it's to me and another guy named Mark. And I quote, he said, hey, fellas, it's Norm here. How are you guys doing? He said, it's been way too long. He said, I wanted to reach out to you both as God seems to be laying it on my heart to do so. God's moving in my life and after many years of my ignoring him, I'm becoming more active in my church, including playing guitar in our praise band. But I know he wants more from me. And I want to ask you both to please pray for me. I know this is out of the blue, but like I said, God's been telling me to reach out to you. Listen to how he ends this. He said, I always have and always will Cherish the years we shared growing up. And despite decades having passed since we last hung out, I have an unyielding trust in you both as brothers in Christ. And I truly appreciate it. So, so, so think about this. Here's a person that is, that is, I'll be 45 in a couple of weeks. Brent's about the same age. And after 20 years of going his own way and, um, now that we've caught up more, just not being interested in the things of Christ, when he's looking for someone that he, that he can count on to pray for him, it wasn't anybody in his present. It was from a couple of guys 20 years ago that were just getting in mischief together. Because it was a faithful and deep friendship. It was guys who had gone through stuff together. And he had, he had known that I was a pastor and he knew this other guy, Mark, was, was, at a, was at a place in his life where he was growing spiritually. And he said, after all these decades, I, I knew and I had trust that I could count on you. And so we've connect, reconnected since then, and we've talked about raising boys and, and raising kids, and, and, I, and I shared the same thing with him. And we, we, we laughed about it again this week, and I told him he was going to be the star of the sermon, and um, then he, he sent me some things that I can't put in the sermon that he reminded me of. But as I was kind of going through all these friends in my life, I was just reminded, man, there's nothing like a faithful friend. 
There's nothing like having somebody in your life that you haven't thought of in 20 years that the Lord puts it on your heart and you say, I, I know that person will pray for me. That's all I'm asking is for prayer. I know that person will pray for me. I mean, don't you want to have those kind of friends in your life? Don't you want to be those kind of friends? So here's three questions and we'll close and I want to show you a picture and we'll be done. Question one that'll help us with this is this. Am I investing myself in friendships that point me to Jesus? Am I investing myself in friendships that point me to Jesus? One thing that I learned after, and I think this is as true for adults as is true for students, but I was a student pastor for 20 years and so that was my context. And one thing I learned during those years was that most students don't choose friendships intentionally. They simply gravitate toward acceptance. Meaning they're not necessarily saying, this is the kind of friend I want in my life. They're doing whatever they can to avoid being rejected. That's the goal of junior high and high school. I want to do everything possible to not be rejected, to not stand out. I want to, I want to be with people that accept me. And look, here's the reality, adults. We do the exact same thing. It's not like you and I went into our workplace and we thought, this is the kind of spiritually mature friend I need in my life. We find people that accept us for who we are, that have similar interests, and th those people end up being our friends. Sometimes that's to our benefit, but other times it's to our detriment because we're not necessarily choosing intentionally and investing in healthy friendships. We're simply trying to be accepted, and we're trying as much as possible to avoid any kind of rejection in our lives. My challenge for us is, our, is to invest ourselves in friendships that will point us to Jesus, to invest. This doesn't mean we use people or that we're disingenuous in relationships, but look, in my life and where you are in your life, I don't have time for friendships that don't push me to be more like Jesus. I need people in my life that when I'm with them, I leave there thinking they make me want to read my Bible more and, and be a better husband and be a better dad and be a better pastor and be a better friend. I, I don't have time and space in my life for people that are going to influence me to not be those things. And I don't think you do either. And so are we investing ourselves in friendships that point us to Jesus? Here's second question. Am I leveraging my friendships so that I'm helping others experience God's best in their lives? And all this is, is the follow-up to that first question. Because in our friendships, we need to be intentionally investing in friendships with people that we trust, people that love Jesus and that will help us be more like Jesus. And at the same time, we have to leverage our friendships so that we're helping other people do the same. Who in your life, when they leave hanging out with you, that they're thinking to themselves, Whenever I'm with them, it makes me consider the things of God. Whenever I'm with them, it makes me think about where I am spiritually. Because that's the kind of friend we need to be to other people. We need to invest ourselves in people that will move us to be more like Jesus. And at the same time, we need to leverage our friendships so that when people leave hanging out with us, they want to be more like Jesus. So when you think about next steps... In your friendships, what is your next step of investing and leveraging in that friendship? Maybe your next step is when a friend calls you and they say, hey, can I talk to you about this issue? Maybe in addition to talking about it, you could also pray with them. Say, so, hey, now that we've talked about this, can I just pray? Can we pray together about this? That one thing would be a game changer in our friendships. If you and I had the boldness and the courage when a friend calls us for advice to say, you know what? Why don't we pray about this too? Or maybe your next step is to get on like our version app and do a Bible study. What if you had devotion time every day with a friend or once a week with a friend? What are our next step into investing in friendships that help us be more like Jesus and leveraging the friendships we have so that we're helping people experience God's best? And then last question, I'm gonna show you a picture, we'll be done. What do I do with unhealthy relationships in my life? What do I do when I have unhealthy relationships in my life? I want to show you a quick graphic. You'll see it on the screen. If we have students in here that I've taught, you've seen this before. We've done, we've done this before. But church, this is a practical way. And if you're an organizer, if you're, this, this will be right up your alley. This is a practical way to make sure that people are at the right place in your life. Because we all have these three levels of friendships. Our core friends, our close friends, and our casual friends. So our, our core friends, and so we'll, I may mention this next week, but that, that bullseye, that, that where it says me, what I believe biblically is that's the relationship that's reserved for you and your spouse, that that's your most intimate friendship. 
Okay, so you can put that there. If you have your spouse, you can put that there. So your core friends in that yellow, there's only a room for a handful of people there. These are the people that you're spending the most of your time with. And these are the people, and this is the most important, that have a high influence on your life. Because what separates these circles is influence and time spent together. So your core of friends has to be people that you trust spiritually, that you're letting them influence your life. You're calling them saying, what do I need to do here? How can I respond to this in a healthy, biblical, and spiritual way? That's your core. That's where you spend most of your time. That's where you're allowing them to have influence on your life. The, uh, the next layer is your close friends. You don't have, uh, you have room for a little bit more there, but you're not spending as much time and, and you don't let them have as much influence on your life. Maybe it's a new friend that you're just not sure. There's not a lot of history there. I assume y'all are taking pictures of the graphic and not me. Because I need, I, need I need a haircut. I got, I'm getting a haircut this week, so I'm a little, I'm a little self-conscious because, you know, my hairline's moving back faster than LeBron's. But I'm assuming it's the graphic, all right? I'm assuming it's the graphic. But I'll stop just, I'm a deep thought here, if you want to get a picture. Okay. And then your casual friends. These are people, and we'll talk about in a couple of weeks about fringe relationships. These are people where you can have everybody that you want in this outer layer. That you don't spend a lot of time with them. These may be coworkers that work in another floor, another building at your office, and they have either limited or no influence on your life. And listen to me, this feels funny because we're doing it with people, but, but I put this in place in my life when I was a brand new Christian. And it sa- this has saved me. This has saved my life at times because I understood how to move people in and out of this. When I was a young pastor, I had some older men in my life that were my core, that I trusted that were, uh, that were investing in my life and helping me. And, and man, a couple of them at the same time went through a bad season in their life where they walked away from their families, they walked away from their marriage, they walked away from their ministry. And so instead of not really knowing what to do and what do I do now, I've got this best friend who's left his wife and his kids. I, I didn't take him out of my life, but he moved to that outer ring. He no longer had influence on my life. I was no longer interested in his advice. I could still be kind and all those things that we talked about, but man, he was moving and I needed somebody else in my core. And listen, this feels weird because we're talking about real people, but if we will put this in practice in our lives, it will save our lives. Because we go through seasons and listen, don't feel funny. People are doing this with us anyway. There's times when you're at a really healthy place in your life and you might be a part of somebody's core, but maybe you go through a season of struggle or you fall back into addiction or you're struggling in a way where you're still their friend, but maybe they're having to move you to a different part of their life. And I want to put this disclaimer on this and then we'll close. This does not mean that we keep abusive or toxic people in our lives. Listen to me. There's no circle for them. There's no space in my life as a follower of Jesus for people that are abusive or toxic and not yours either. If you're in an abusive relationship physically or emotionally, if you're in a toxic relationship, there is no obligation, I believe, biblically, that you keep them in your life or they have any measure of influence. They don't get a circle. You move them out and you ask us for help. This does not mean that we say, okay, well, I've got to have space for everybody. So at least in my casual friends, I've got these people that are emotionally or physically or spiritually abusive or toxic in my life. No, they, they don't get a circle. I have full confidence saying you move them out and you let us help you. This does not mean that, well, Jesus says I love everybody, so I just take it. That's bull hockey. That's my filter, right? That's bull hockey, all right? This does not mean that there's space and place in our lives and our hearts for toxic and abusive people, that we don't want them to have any influence on us. And they may not be at a place where they're open to our influence. So until they are, they, they don't get a circle, Right? Church, listen to me. If we will put this to practice in our lives, there's no greater joy in your life, I don't think in my life, than to have healthy, deep, abiding friendships. Because we're gonna grow at a rapid pace when we have other people in our core that are helping us, that are influencing our lives. I wanna be with people that when I leave hanging out with them, that I wanna be more like Jesus. I wanna leave people... I want to be with people when I leave their house. It makes me want to invest greater in my marriage. It makes me want to be a better dad, a better husband, a better citizen. Those are the kind of people we need in our lives. It doesn't mean that we're abusive or disingenuous. It just means that we have to invest and leverage our friendships for maximum gospel impact because the ripple effect of that is life-giving. We know this. Every one of us have known 
how it feels and how our emotional and spiritual life can be simply just, we feel like it's being drained out of us in an unhealthy friendship. It's the worst. But at the same time, there is nothing more life-giving than to know that you've got people in your life that want you to be a follower of Jesus, that want you to grow spiritually and want to speak truth into your life that are honest and transparent with you. I need that so much in my life. And the seasons of my life where I've grown the most spiritually have been those times. And I'm so grateful that, that when I have when I go through something or have a tough time, that there's people that I can call that I know will tell me the truth and love me deeply like a love of David and Jonathan. But I know that I'll hang up the phone and think, man, I need to be more like Jesus because of them. Because when we're intentional in our friendships and we choose to invest and leverage them for Jesus, the ripple effect just won't be felt by us, but it'll be felt by our church and our community as we continue to make a big deal about Jesus. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. This is an important message, I believe, for our church. So I I thank you for your grace and a few extra minutes. Our worship team is going to come. They're going to lead us. And it's just a short time of response. Here's what I'm asking of us. Those two things. Are we investing in friendships that help us be more like Jesus? And are we leveraging those relationships so that we're helping other people experience God's best in their lives? God, church, there's too much at stake around us. There's too many needs and hurts and pains in our community for us to spend all of our time with people that aren't helping us grow spiritually. And there's too many hurts in the lives of our friends for us to be spending time in friendship with them, not encouraging them and helping them to be more like Jesus. It's life-giving for us. And we see it exampled over and over and over in scripture. So as we have this closing song, just right where you are, just ask the Lord by way of the Holy Spirit to, to help you evaluate your relationships. Maybe there's a friendship that you need to invest in more because it's somebody God brought into your life that can be a great encouragement to you. Or maybe there's a friendship that's, that's unhealthy and you need to make some adjustments in your life and, and limit the amount of influence that you're giving them in your life. Maybe this is a conversation you need to have around the table with your family if your kids are struggling with friendships and trying to choose and who they hang out with. This is a great conversation to have as a family that we're making sure that we're, we're loving well, we're serving all, but we're being intentional in those people that influence our lives. So Jesus, we pray that you would help us. God, we we do wanna be faithful and loyal and humble and real and authentic. And we wanna experience the ripple effects of that. But but God, would you help us to manage our friendships in a healthy way? Would you help us to be salt and light to everyone, to, to love all, to be accepting of all, but at the same time to know that it's important who we let influence our lives? God, would you help us to make hard decisions when it comes to our relationships? And and God, would you help us to leverage our friendships with those people that give us influence so that we can help each other be more like Jesus. And God, we pray that this church would be known as a church that's friendly and we would be known as a place that invests in each other because we care enough about each other to push each other to be more like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen.